Um, I haven't done it the last couple of Sundays, uh, so, uh, but I, I want to get to this this morning. Uh, we live, you know, in, in crazy times, uh, and there's just a lot of turmoil in our nation. So regardless of how you feel about the outcome of this last presidential election, we need to pray for our leaders. Um, and so, from my experience, when the person I voted for gets in office, I find it much easier to pray for him than when my choice didn't get there. So I'm saying, Lord, give me some guidance so I don't pray Travis here, so that I pray your will and things that you would have me to pray for uh, for our president. So Psalm 72 is what the Lord gave me. He says, give the king thy judgments, O God. So you can pray, God, help President Biden to make good choices. Give him your judgments. Give him, give him good judgments. And thy righteousness unto the king's son. Lord, let what comes be right and be righteous and be things that, uh, that uh, righteousness exalts the nation. And so we can pray those things. Number two he shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. Folks, God is on the side of the powerless and the poor. Read through your Old Testament. Read through Psalms. Read through Proverbs. God is on the side of the powerless and poor. He defends the widows. He defends the orphans. He defends the poor. And so we would do very well to pray, God, let our government take care of the powerless and the poor we will be on the Lord's side when we're on the side of the powerless and the poor. Uh, and so, you know, we need to stand up for that. There's another good thing to pray. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills righteousness. Folks, verse 3, let's pray. We're going to do that this morning. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to go through this whole psalm. Psalm 3, what we're going to pray right now is peace and righteousness on the United States. So uh, would you join with me right now? Father, we come for our nation. We come for President Biden and Vice President Harris, their families and their counselors, Lord God, the Senate of the United States and the Supreme Court of the United States, the House of Representatives. Peace, O oh God. There's turmoil and tumult and warfare, God, going on in our federal government, and its seeds are throughout this entire nation. Oh, God, bring peace. Bring peace. Bring peace, Lord God. Let peace rule and reign in the United States of America. Oh, God, your spirit to, to rule and to reign. God, let righteousness, right actions, actions that exalt God, let them be manifest in every church and every Christian and every politician who says, I am a follower of Christ, let them stand for righteousness against all manner of evil. Oh, Lord, let peace reign from the East Coast to the West. Let peace reign from the Canadian border to the southern border with Mexico. Let peace reign along the Gulf Coast and across our nation from, from the mountains to the, to the valleys to the prairies. Lord, everywhere across this nation, Oh, Lord, let your peace reign. Start it in our federal government. Oh, God, peace, peace we speak unto them today. Health, Lord, and life, God, we speak to them today. Let our Christians that have been elected, let them stand up for the truth of your word above all else. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can take Psalm 72 if you will do it and make it a part of your prayer regimen. To pray, uh, to pray for our leaders, uh, and it'll be a, a good tool for you and help you to find some things that you can pray, you know. So, uh, amen. All right. This morning, this morning I want to uh, talk to you a little bit. I have done very little since I have been here about talking to you about about giving. But you know what? The Bible has a whole lot to say about giving. And I haven't had to preach any of those messages about, we really need you to give because you all, as I said earlier, have really bought in. Uh, you've been discipled in that. You've been trained in that. And you understand the value in that. Nevertheless, from time to time, 
understand that I'm not preaching this message to you this morning because the coffers are low, okay? I'm not preaching this message to you today because the offerings have been down. This is just the word of the Lord for today. This is what Father God says that we need to hear today. Okay, so don't start looking at me sideways and saying, oh, what's wrong? Have the offerings not been good? Uh, you know, no, it's none of that. It's just we believe in all the Word, right? All the Word, all the gospel, Genesis to Revelation, we believe in it all. So time to time, there will be messages on giving. And I'm going to preach this morning from 1 Kings chapter number 17. So let me say, church, America is a nation that is driven by a consumer mindset. When I was a kid, uh, we had this big piece of furniture that sat in the corner of the living room, and in it, it had a television. <laughs> and that thing weighed, I don't know, it seemed to me as a kid, it seemed like it was extremely heavy. Well, from time to time, that television would go out, Dad and my uncle from across the street would lift it, put it in the back of Dad's truck, drive it to a particular place, and it would be repaired. They'd have it for a week or so. We'd bring it back, and we'd keep using that same TV. You don't repair a television anymore. Consumer, might, they don't make them to be repaired. They make them to be tossed and another one to be purchased, you know, Uh there was in every little town that I was aware of a, a person who had a shop that repaired shoes. Take your boots or your shoes and you go in there and fix them. Put a new heel on your boots. Put a new sole on your shoes. Uh, repair them. Fix them. Does anybody fix shoes anymore? Maybe, but not in every little town. There was a business that was the, you know, the cobbler that fixed everybody's shoes. Why? Now you just buy a new pair. You just buy another one. Just replace them, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so uh, it used to be that, that, you know, dad spent a lot of Saturdays out under the shade tree working and repairing cars. I've seen him put, uh, put new shocks out there in the yard. I've seen him, him and my brother overhaul motors and, and pull them and put them back in right out there in the yard and do all kinds of, of mechanical work. You can't do that anymore uh, because, you know, cars are so different now than what they used to be. Everything's run by computer and you can't just go out in the yard and yank the motor out and put it back in. It'll never work again because, because of all the electronics. But our, our country, our mindset, who mends clothing anymore? We just throw it away and go buy something else when it gets tore up or donate it to Goodwill or Salvation Army or something like that. You understand how, how things have changed. It's this consumer mindset that that people have anymore. You know what? The reason I'm bringing it up is because if we're not careful, that consumer mindset bleeds right into how we do church. And it comes right into our church. Here, think about this. Consumer mindset, you start seeing stuff for Christmas in August. When you go into the stores, Christmas trees and lights and decorations and, and packaged Christmas presents are in stores starting in August I'm not exaggerating. You know it's true. You've seen it. Uh, uh, then, you know, Valentine's Day merchandise is out before December is over. You can go in and they're already pulling Christmas stuff down and, and got Valentine's Day stuff uh, on the shelves in, in December. Uh, Halloween products start being on the shelves uh, in, in July sometimes. And you start seeing, you know, advertisements. Why? It's all the next thing. It's all the next thing. I was amazed for several years I worked in retail. I worked in a shoe store for about seven or eight years. Summer's just started and we're already marking down all the whites, all the summer stuff. We're already having that because why? In about two weeks, the fall merchandise is going to come in. And while it's July, we're already putting out the uh, fall shoes and the fall line, the fall handbags and all of that. And I'm thinking, we don't even get to enjoy summer and we're already, <laughs> we're already moving to the, next, to, to the next thing. Even in Pentecostal mindsets uh, like an assembly of God church like we have, if we're not careful, a consumer mindset will creep in. And in, in us, in church, it looks like this. What can I get from worship today? 
what can I get from worship today? I sure need something from worship today. I've had a bad week. I'm in a bad mood. I had a fight. I, I'm, I'm not feeling well. I need to get something from worship. Now, folks, understand me. We receive when we worship. I'm talking about the mindset that every time we gather together, we're thinking, what can I get? Because if we're in the consumer mindset at church and thinking about what can we get, then the first couple of uh, the first time that you go a week or two and you don't get from church, you're looking for another one, another church. You're looking for another place. I'm not getting what I need from that church. I need to look somewhere else because I'm going to church to consume. Oh, I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens on this, but it's the truth. It's the truth, and you know it is. What can I get from the preaching? Well, you know, I just didn't get anything from that today. He just, he never preaches what I need to hear. He never preaches on my favorite topic. He, I, I just didn't get anything uh, from, from that today. What can I get from the altar call? What can I get from children's ministry? What can I get to, uh, if I make the trip back for evening service? What, what's the value in this for me? Now, folks, I want you to know something. My God is a giver. God is always a giver, and you can't outgive God. And when we enter in, but you see, the, the fundamental difference in what I'm trying to say is the mindset. The big 10 cent word is paradigm, the mindset that you come into it with. If you're coming into the mindset looking for what am I going to get today, then if they aren't friendly in the hallway, you're not happy. And if the worship had songs that you didn't like, you're not happy. And if the preaching is on giving, you're not happy. <laughs> and if, uh, you know, if, if it's too hot or it's too cold or too loud or too long or whatever, then you're not happy because you didn't get what you felt like you needed from the service. But when you make up your mind that the reason that you are here is to give, I'm here today to give glory to my God. I'm here today to give service to my Lord. I'm here today because God is worth it. When I don't feel good, when I'm not excited, when I've had a bad week, when the enemy is against me, I'm going to go to the worship service because God is worthy. And I'm going to give him what he is due. I'm going to give. I'm not going to get. When you have the mindset that I'm going to to give, to give unto the Lord, then you'll find that while you're busy giving, you're getting at the same time. You come in with the mindset of I've got to get something and many times you'll walk out feeling like I got nothing from that. All right, follow me now. He delights in giving gifts to his people. But I want to tell you this morning about one of the greatest gifts that we can get and that is when we become sacrificial givers. Giving more than is required. Giving more than the minimum. You know, it's coming up on tax time pretty soon. And folks, let me tell you, I love the United States of America, but I'm going to give to uh, the federal government the bare minimum, <laughs> you know. Maybe if they did ev everything that Travis wanted them to do and didn't do anything Travis didn't want them to do, maybe I'd give extra, you know. But there's a lot of stuff that our government does that I don't agree with and neither do you, and so I'm going to give the bare amount that I can and be legal. But when it comes to the kingdom of the Lord, God, the Almighty, everything He does is good. Everything he does is righteous. Everything he does is noble. I want to give and give and give until I can't give anymore because God will continue to pour back into my life when I give. 1 Kings 17, verse number 9. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. She said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of oil in a jug. I'm gathering a couple of sticks to go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. 
but first make me a little cake and bring it to me. And afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of oil was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Father, thank you for your scripture. Help me, Lord, to minister the message just as you would have it to be ministered today, that your kingdom might be built up and that your people might be challenged and encouraged by the word and by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice, this is one of those stories that's just like, wow, wow. But I want you to notice something that for a long time I overlooked in this. At the very beginning of the story, when God tells Elijah to go, he says, I've prepared a widow woman. You see, in Pentecostal circles and charismatic circles, if you're not careful, people will try to use people will try to use their position or their authority, or they will try to uh, claim that the Holy Spirit says things to try to manipulate you. This woman was being asked for a very sacrificial gift. She was down to the last bit of bread and the last bit of oil. That's all she had. They were going to eat their last pancake (laughs) and then prepare for starvation to set in. That's what she said. It wasn't that this crazy preacher showed up and said, Woman! Feed me first. It was that God had already been dealing with her about the situation before he ever showed up. It's right there in black and white in your Bible. So when somebody comes to you and they says, I've got a word for you. God says, if it's really from God, it's going to confirm something that the Lord has already been dealing with you about. Huh? Otherwise, otherwise it's, it's manipulative. It's awfully hard to say, no, I can't do that when somebody in authority says, God says, because then you're rebelling against God. People have been built and, 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 and abused, and they're, they have a horrible opinion of churches and pastors and spiritual leaders because they've been taken advantage of all in the name of God. God had already been dealing with her. God had already been dealing with her before Elijah ever showed up to ask for this. So, I want you to understand that there should be a witness in your spirit. God will deal with you. If the challenge is there to step up and to give and to do something that is sacrificial to you, the Holy Spirit will give you witness if it's really for you, right? If you're spirit-filled, you know what I'm talking about. You will have an inner witness in your spirit uh, that even though what you're being asked to do is great uh, and, and awesome and fearful to give what you're being asked to give, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you will bear witness with what is being said to you from the flesh. So first of all, the woman was needy. Conditions in her life were bad. There was a drought, there was a famine, she was down to the end. There was no more. Today was the last day. But Elijah asked her to give him something first. Now, we would like to think that God would send the prophet there to tell her, Woman, God has filled your barrel of meal and he's filled your cruise of oil and because it's full, now give me something. We'd say, yeah, that makes sense. To the human, it does, right? For him to be a prophet of God and say, God has said your oil is full and your barrel is overflowing. But he didn't. He found this woman out there gathering some wood, some sticks of wood just to go in and build a small enough fire to fry up one little, bake up whatever in their little oven, one one last piece of bread and, and be done. 
That's how she founds her, in her point of need. Yet she was asked first to give to God before receiving anything from God. Folks, sometimes we walk in these doors or we come into our prayer time with God and we feel in some area of our life like we're like that widow woman. We don't know that we can make it another day. We don't know that we can go any further. We've had it with our marriage. We've had it with our kids. We've had it with our boss. We've had it with life. We've had it with this health problem that is, that is plaguing us. And we're just, you know, we're gathering up our sticks. We're gathering up because we're just almost done. We're ready to just cash out. We're ready to be d- Y'all don't look at me like that. I bet many of you in the room have been to that point where you're just fed up. You've had it up to here, and you're just done. And God, in the midst of your need ministers to you in the middle of your need and just says, put the job, put the family, put the financial worries, put the marriage strife, just lay it down and give first. And we come in and we give and we sing, Lord, I love you and I lift my voice and I give you praise and I surrender all and we just worship him and we listen and we praise him and we find out that in the middle of our last little bit, last little bit of sanity, last little bit of strength, last little bit of money. In the middle of it, somehow God has spoken to us and we can put another foot in front of the other and we can keep on going because we gave even when we were poor and down to the last little bit. There's something divine at work here. There's a divine principle at work in this story. She was asked to give the very thing that she was out of. In order to receive the blessing of God for herself, she was asked to give of the thing that she thought she had nothing to give. Hmm. Jesus gives us this same principle in the New Testament. It's reported to us in Acts chapter number 20, the word of the Lord that said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes we use that verse right there when we've asked somebody to give something and he or she is not happy about the giving and we say, well, you know, the Lord says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Some of you are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. I really don't want to give that. I don't want to come for that work day. I don't want to give an offering. I and we say, well, you know, it's more, sometimes it's me looking at me in the mirror and saying, Travis, you know, <laughs> it's more blessed to give than to receive. We would prefer to get, the human side of us would prefer to get, to receive, to get from God. I want to get, and then when it's a convenient season because I have gotten, then maybe I'll get. If I like you, (laughs) you know, if, if you touch my soft spot in my heart, you know, if we're having a good day, then because I've received so much, then I'll give. A little bit. Let me tell you something. God says give. God says give. What do you mean? God says give love to the unlovely. (laughs) Oh, but I don't want to do that. I want to give love to the people that that are like me, that I love, that give me love back. And God says give love to the unlovely. Oh, what? I don't have enough. I need more love. And God says give love to those that are unlovely. I'm telling you, there's a divine principle here. God says, give the other cheek to the one who hit you uh, in the first place. That's a hard one because we want to bow up and give them back what the what for. But he says, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Give them. uh, Lord, you're asking me to do what goes against my nature. And God says, I'm telling you, give. Give. Listen to this. God says, when they make you go one mile, give them two. Oh. Pastor, go back to preaching what you did last week about a new thing. I can get behind that. I like that. Telling me i got to give love to people that don't love me back, and and, and I've got to give a soft answer to those that are giving me harsh words, and I've got to go an extra mile further than what I'm required to do. Oh, my goodness. You know what he says? He says, if they take away your cloak, give them your tunic as well. 
He didn't say to come to take away your cloak, grab your sword, and cut their ear off. <laughs> he said, give, give. Listen, he said, give forgiveness to them when you have been wronged. He says, give, 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 give. Folks, I'm telling you something here. We have become in this mindset, we, and I'm, I'm using that pronoun, we. I'm not saying you all, but we get so programmed into, well, if somebody gives me love, I'll give them some love back. If somebody gives me a blessing, I'll bless them back. If somebody's nice to me, I'll be nice back. If somebody, uh, you know, uh, does something good for me, I'll repay that goodness. The Lord himself said, what good does it do if you do good to those that do good unto you? But I'm telling you, he said, the sinners, the outcast, those that don't know God, they do that. But I'm telling you, those that are troublemakers, those that give you problems, those that are unlovely, those that are unforgiving, those that are harsh, you've got to give unto them. You've got to give when you don't have. You see, uh, uh, psychologically speaking, they talk about people having an emotional uh, gas tank, an emotional tank. And they can really only give, according to psychologists, when that emotional tank is full. Right? And, and, and you can't give love unless your love tank is full. And you can't give forgiveness unless your forgiveness tank is full. I'm sorry. Maybe that's how it works outside the church. But inside the body of Christ, if we give out of our nothingness, if we give when we're feeling, you know, maybe somebody's wronged us and what we really want to do is to give them a tongue lashing and a piece of our mind, but instead we give them peace, instead we give them a blessing, instead we just hush our mouths and walk away and pray for them and, and give them forgiveness. Instead, we find out that God fills those love tanks. I don't have to be depending on somebody else to make me full. And then maybe I'll give a little bit, but I don't want to run out. When we give what God says, give, the barrel is full, the oil is full, and we can eat for many days. We just get this whole thing backwards. We get this whole thing backwards. When I've got enough, when I've got more than enough, when there's more than enough, then I'll give it to somebody else. Jesus says in Luke 6 and 38, give, and then it shall be given unto you. Focus on those first couple of words. Give, and it will be given unto you. If I want love, I need to give love. Huh? If I want acceptance, I need to give acceptance. If I want forgiveness, I need to give forgiveness. You can find scripture on every one of these things that I'm talking to you about right now. If I want to get help, I need to give help. If I want to get friends, I need to give friendship. If I want to receive, you know, prayers, I need to give prayers. It's not all about gimme, 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 gimme. Folks, there's a time when we're gimme, 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 gimme. There's a time. That's infanthood. That's babyhood. That's spiritual immaturity when it's all about give me. Give me a song. Give me a word. Give me a sermon. Give me an uplift. Give me a prayer. Give me some anointing oil. Give me, give me, give me. And then we all need to grow up to the point where we're saying, yes, I still have need, but let me give you a prayer. Let me give you a blessing. Let me give you a word. Let me give you a hug, an encouragement, a, a, a challenge. Let me give unto you because we find that the blessing, the greatest blessings I've ever had as a pastor have been in times of giving to other people and you realize the blessedness of joy and fullness that comes back to you unseen from God, you're giving out and God's got a funnel somehow just pouring into you while you're giving out. And sometimes you don't even realize it until it's over and you realize how God has blessed. I'm telling you, God, but when we sit around waiting with our little cup out saying, well, Lord, there's just not enough for me. You got to fill this up, Lord. You got to fill this up so I can... Folks... We're always missing some of our greatest blessings because we're always worried about what's in it for me. It does not say in Luke 6, when things are given to you, then you should give. There's the verse right there, copied and pasted right out of my Bible onto the screen. It says, give. Give what? Give what? I know we use this when we're talking about money. 
but you can put in there, give time, time, T-I-M-E, not the stuff you cook with, time, <laughs> give time, and time will be given to you. Huh? You understand the point? Give your money, money comes back somehow. Those of you that are tithers understand that principle very well. You give and God blesses. Whew. Give your energy, energy comes back to you. Give of your talents. Jesus said those that had a few talents, he gave more in that parable. Hmm? Give your skill, give your abilities, give your possessions. When you give out of what you already have, even if in your eyes it's only a little bit. Well, I don't have much. But if you'll give out of what you have, church, I'm telling you, when God sees that giving heart, God is going to bless you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And often he uses, just like it says there, people will give into your lap. You're giving and God funnels it through other people. God funnels it to you somehow. Let me tell you a story very quickly. I had a guy who was my sound man in one particular church that I pastored. He had been adopted, and he had been adopted by a, uh, a family, and, and his adopted parents had passed away, and he had figured out who his, now he's my age, okay, and this has been about 15 years ago. He figured out who his uh, biological mom was, never even looked for her until his adopted parents were gone. Found out his adopted mother was an avowed atheist. When he found her, she was in declining health. And he only knew her for a couple of years before she passed away. They had put a relationship back together enough that when she passed away, he was called out to California because there was nobody else. So he went out to California to settle her estates. This man and his wife didn't have very good jobs. They both worked, but really not great jobs. They didn't have much money. They struggled. He went out to California, settled his mom's estate. She had two or three rent houses. He sold some property. <laughs> he called me. He said, Pastor, Mother, said she never believed in God, didn't believe in God, never gave a cent of money to any church. He said, the first thing, as soon as the lawyer tells me it's okay, is I'm going to pay off the church's indebtedness. It's the first thing that's going to happen. At that point, the church was $60,000 in debt. We got in about $900 on a Sunday morning. That was a lot of money. You know what? On an Easter Sunday morning, I stood in front of the church, and we celebrated <clears throat> that financial gift. After he closed everything out, he gave. He had nothing. You would have think that somebody that would, you know, been just living hand to mouth all of his adult life, get a sudden windfall like that, and he'd have been paying off his house and, and buying a new car and investing for retirement. But the first thing he did was he gave to God. I want to tell you, he got back home, things switched around, he got a job where he was making almost twice the amount per hour that he was making before, working at the nuclear factory in, in, in Russellville, the nuclear energy plant down there in Russellville, went from making just barely above minimum wage to twice what he was making per hour. Blessings began to flow back on him, which I won't take any more time to tell you that story, but I want to tell you. I know and he knows those blessings came because when he was blessed, first thing he did was he said, I'm giving this away. I'm giving this into the work of the Lord. Oh, I'd like to take that $60,000 and, and put it as a down payment on a new home or, or blah, blah, blah and use it on me, but I'm going to give it to the house of the Lord. I'm going to give it into God's work. And folks, let me tell you, he generated much more than that $60,000 coming back on him in blessings because he was willing to give. How many people have you heard of who come in, maybe you've known some, who come into a financial windfall and within just a few years they're worse off than they were at the beginning? Yeah. But Mike was smart enough 
and in tune with the Spirit enough to know if I want to maintain the blessing, I've got to be a giver. I've got to be a giver. So what are your needs right now? If you can find a way to give out of your point of need, you will receive blessings from God. What does that mean, Pastor, practically speaking? It works something like this. You need salvation, so you come and you give your heart to God. You give. What do you receive back? (laughs) Your name written in the Lamb's book of life and an eternal salvation where you will never have need of salvation again. You will have a new heart. You will have an eternal life because you give this one away. Salvation, you give and you receive, right? You, you, You tracking with me on that? You need peace, so you give God some time today in prayer. Your life is just... You've got 99 things on the list that you need to do when you get out of church today. So so because you need some peace, you need some time, you stop and you give God 5, 10, 15 minutes. Nothing else, not TV, not family time, not anything. You carve out some time and you give that to God. And you'll find that when you pause and you give to God, somehow the rest of your day just divinely falls into place and the things that need to get done get done you've got the strength and the patience and the energy to get those things done you need help with something in your life so you find somebody that you can help huh what are you talking about you need help with something you're struggling you need counseling or you need budgeting advice or you need uh, help with a, an actual project around your home or you need help with learning a new skill whatever you're needing some help something you can't do for yourself find somebody that you can help and you give some help to them and i'm telling you It will come back to you pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You'll find that God will send help your way when you help somebody else. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? But it works. It's a principle of God's Word. The widow needed food. She gave food. If we give out of our area of need, we can expect to receive more in return. Look at Luke 6 and 38, the last part. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Tablespoon, (laughs) you get back multiplied on what you gave. A cup full, you get back multiplied on what you gave. Give time, you can expect your time to be blessed. Give financially, you can expect your finances to be blessed. Now, folks, that doesn't always mean I'm going to drop 100 in the box And God's going to give me back 500 or 1,000. It doesn't always work quite that way. But your finances will be blessed. Uh, It's like a good friend of mine, Doug Adams in Hot Springs, Arkansas, says. He got into church and, and got to tithing before his wife got a hold of it. And he said she would sit down before he started tithing and say, which bill are we going to pay this month and which ones are we going to put off? Because there just wasn't enough money to cover all their obligations. He started tithing and she said, you know, Doug, I don't understand. The same amount of money's coming in and you're giving extra to the church and we've paid everything and we still have some money at the end of the month. The world can't explain it because it's not a worldly phenomenon. But if you give sacrificially to the Lord, your finances will be blessed. Sometimes it works out like this. You don't have to buy that new set of tires on the car quite as soon, you know. You don't have to replace the washer or the dryer, uh, uh, you know, quite as soon. The hot water tank uh, uh, keeps heating water uh, for a while longer. The refrigerator keeps running. The shingles on the roof stay good a little longer. And you don't have to spend money elsewhere. Uh, uh, A preacher I grew up under said he was evangelizing and he was getting all of his money from revivals so he went through December when churches don't hold a lot of revivals and things were kind of short and so he didn't pay tithes so he's out in early January and he's uh he's he and his brother are going to cut uh they're going to cut wood for a little while to try to make some money because they haven't been preaching revivals so they're out 
cutting down pine trees to take them and, and sell them to the paper mill, his chainsaw breaks. <laughs> he takes it to the shop. He has it repaired. When he gets the bill, the bill for repairing his chainsaw was exactly what he was supposed to put in and tithe. He said, God kicked him in the seat of the pants and showed him a lesson, you know. You can give it to me and I'll bless that old chainsaw and you abundantly or, you know, you, you can pay bills that you didn't, you know, didn't expect to have to pay. Now, he says that with a smile on his face, but he means that he learned a lesson that I'd much prefer to give it to God because his blessings are greater. All he got back from the steel chainsaw shop was a, an old chainsaw that had been repaired and, you know, it still was subject to break down again. But when I give my finances to God, what he gives back is fresh and new and growing and abundantly more than what I ever gave him in the first place. When we give like the widow out of our need, God multiplies it back. She had a small cake. She gave it. She and her son had flour and oil. In other words, they had food for the rest of the drought. History says that wasn't a day or two. Some of your commentaries will say it was three to six months. There are some that will say it was a year to 18 months. Whatever, she gave one meal to one prophet, and she got months and months of supply out of it. God did abundantly more than what she gave in the first place. <laughs> this is what Jesus was talking about when he has his disciples and they're at the temple and they're standing there by the treasury and these guys are coming and they're taking their money bags and they're dumping them in the treasury. Pastor Steve probably taught you about this, but the treasury where they poured their offering in, they had made them into metal boxes that they poured. <clears throat> and so these guys wanting to gain attention to themselves would, uh, would gather a lot of the small coins so that they'd bring in these big bags and they could pour. You know, if you're going to give $10, you can give a $10 bill or you can give a whole bunch of quarters or a whole bunch of dimes. And if somebody doesn't know what's in the bag and you dump out all those dimes, it's still just $10, but it makes a big racket, <laughs> right? And so they pour their offerings into these metal flutes and it makes a big noise. And people are like, wow, wow, did you hear all of that? Wow, how, wow, he's really wealthy. Did you hear all the money he gave? And then this woman walks up there and she's got, in our vernacular, two pennies. <laughs> and she drops her clunk, clunk. <laughs> What's that? Jesus says, guys, I want you to know that woman right there gave more than those who came before her. Because they had a whole lot and they gave a small percentage. But she took the last two coins that she owns and she brought them and put them in the offering plate. She's got nothing. She gave 100% to, to the Lord. It was all given. So the blessing that she receives will be greater than those who gave a small percentage of you tracking with me on that? You understand? Jesus knew that she gave everything that she had. Her blessing was greater. Philippians 4 and 19 says, My God shall supply, my God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory. So, folks, you can't outgive God. Whether it's your finances or your time or your energy or your talent or your ability, you cannot outgive God. God. When we give in Jesus' name, we're not repaid by, you know, by Microsoft or Apple or Chase Bank or whomever because as rich as they may be, their finances still are finite. But when we give, it's not a stimulus check from the U.S. Treasury that repays us <laughs> because God is our source. God is our source. Now, don't get me wrong. God may use a stimulus check as a resource, but that is not your source. Welfare is not your source. Your boss is not your source. 
Listen to me. Your bank account, your retirement account, uh, your 401K or whatever it is, uh, uh, your, your health savings account, it is not your source. I'm telling you, your health is not your source. Your mind is not your source. Catch a hold of this with me. Your, that is not your source. It is a resource that has been given to you by the source of all sources, uh, by God who is the one and only source. So if I give everything my resource, my brain has to give, uh, I can trust that God will bless me richly and abundantly because He's the source. <laughs> Amen. God is my source. So what do I worry about? God wants to bless you, and God does not play favorites. But God's blessings are conditional. God's word says, if you, then I. That's a conditional promise. If you want salvation, admit that you're in need. Confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe on him in your heart. Then you shall be saved. It's an if then. It's conditional. It's available for everybody, but it's got conditions. If you want your finances to be blessed, you start at the level of the 10%, the tithe. <clears throat> and you give. If you give, if you bring into my storehouse, if you prove me therewith, then I will pour out my blessings upon you. <clears throat> That's what the Word of God says. You can challenge me. You cannot like what I'm preaching. You can get a burr under your saddle, as we say, but your problem is not with me. Your problem is with the Word of God because God's promises, oh, but grace, God's grace extends it all to us. There are certain things that God does just because He's God. He's going to keep the sun burning and the world turning and gravity working because He's just God. But there are many blessings that Christian people never activate because we don't do our part of the equation. We don't do our part of activating God's promises in His Word. You can look with me in Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. I think I've got the slides for this, but if you have your Bible, Ecclesiastes the preacher, he says in chapter number 11, verse number 1, cast your bread upon the waters, for you'll find it after many days. What in the world is that talking about? Bread, daily sustenance, that which was vital for that culture in which, the time when Solomon lived, who wrote this Ecclesiastes. Bread the daily staple of their diet. He says, take your bread, that which you need to eat every day, and cast it upon the waters. <laughs> what? He's saying there, he's saying there to be free in your giving. Be free in your giving and trust that when you give, God will resupply. Cast your bread upon the waters, and in many days you will find it. You see, now you're giving. Now you're in the process of giving because none of us know when we're going to be in that spot where, uh-oh, I've got nothing to give. When we find ourselves in the spot where we don't have any bread to give, <laughs> then all that bread that we've given away when we could comes back to us. Hmm. The prayers that you've prayed, maybe you can think of it this way. I bet every one of you in the room have been hit by situations, storms, circumstances where you just, you knew you needed to pray, you knew praying was the right thing, but you just couldn't pray. Your mind was a mess and you just, all you wanted to do was cry or get mad or hit something and you, you knew you needed to pray and it's in that moment when praying is so hard for you to do that the prayers you've given out during the easy days, the sunny days, the regular days, that those prayers come back on you again. That's what this is talking about. When you're writing the check and, and there's plenty of money left and then something happens, the job runs out, you know, a, a huge bill comes your way, there's a crisis. When you've given, like my dad said, after working in one particular job from high school for about 30 years and then them telling him, we're shutting down your department, you don't have a job, he didn't go to college, he didn't go to trade school, didn't go to Votech. He had no training except on-the-job training, and he'd worked in that factory for 30 years. 
risen to the head of his department, and then was told, it's done. We've decided we can save money by outsourcing what you do. Dad came home, and after a little while of tears, my dad was able to say, we have tithed, and we have been faithful to God in our finances all these years. God will take care of us. And he did. Dad used his two weeks of vacation time. At the end of that vacation time, he got another job doing what he had been doing before for another company, making more money and in a much more relaxed atmosphere than he was working in before. God is faithful. God is faithful. We give. Verse 2 says, give a portion to seven and also to eight. Ecclesiastes 11, 2. What? This means be generous in your giving. Give as much as you can of your time, of your energy, of your efforts, of your money. Give, give, give. How many of you have heard stories about people that look like they were absolutely penniless? I mean, they ate, lived in garbage houses, and, and they, you know, they, they took food from uh, food pantries, and, and after they died and somebody's in there cleaning up, they find hidden money. You know, man, I've heard several of those stories over my lifetime. Kids go in to clean up, and there's jars of money that have been hidden in closets and stuck here, and, 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 and you know, what in the world's going on? I'm so afraid that I'm not going to have enough for me that I'm hoarding it away, and I'm hiding it away, and I'm doing without. Mm, folks, that's not what God says, do. God says Give. Cast your bread upon the water. Give to seven and to eight. Why? Because the same God who got it to me is able to get it through me. If God gets it through me, then God will resupply what I have need of. That's why we cannot be afraid to step out and to give, to give sacrificially when we're giving in service of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If God, if we keep God's conditions, we will be blessed. Give your heart to Jesus. Look at the blessings that come. Give your life as a living sacrifice, according to Romans chapter number 12. Look at the blessings that flow back when we lay down our lives as a sacrifice to Christ. Only trust God as your source. Everything else is just a resource supplied by the source. <laughs> Man. I'm telling you, that right there, that nugget right there is, is powerful if you'll grab a hold of that because we, we tend to think about the church general fund as our source. And if the source dries up, uh, it's not the source. God's the source. The general fund is the resource that is supplied by the source. Or we think about our job. I can't afford to make the boss mad. If I make the boss mad and lose my job, what am I going to do? The, the job is just a resource. God is your source. We can grab a hold of that in all things. It'll help us not to live in fear and doubt and trust God to supply. God will supply. God will meet the need. God did not create you to be a reservoir. I, I, I'm Southern. You may not know what I'm trying to say. That's a hard word for this Southern tongue to pronounce. God didn't create you to be a well. <laughs> he didn't create you to be a holding tank. You can't find that in the pages of God's Word. What He created you to be, the Scripture says, is to be a giver. He created you to be a giver of water. Out of your innermost being shall flow. He didn't say, out of your innermost being shall supply you with a well that you can just, it'll be deep and you can never, you know, it'll all be for you. That's what a well, you think of a well no, he says a river, a stream that flows out from you. Jesus said that you're to be givers of light. He said you don't take the light that has been given you and hide it so you can only use it for yourself. But you set it on a lampstand so that the whole house may be filled with light. You set it on a hillside so the whole countryside can be lit up with the light. That talks about giving, giving water. That's spiritual life, giving light. That's pointing everybody we can to Jesus Christ. He says you're to be salt. What good is salt if it just sits in a box in your pantry? What good is salt if it just sits in a shaker by your stove or on your table? It's no good at all. 
eventually it gathers up moisture and gets hard and you toss it out because you haven't used it. It's been no good at all, but when you take that salt and you shake it on the ice, <laughs> it does some good. And you take that salt and put it on your french fries. You take that salt and put it on the food. Boy, it, it, it adds flavor. Before refrigeration, salt was how things were preserved before everybody had a freezer and a refrigerator. Take that meat, salt it down, and preserve it so that you could use it later. Salt is a... I used to have trouble with getting... A, ingrown toenails when I was uh, in junior high and uh, a few times they'd get infected and our old country doctor would say, take that boy home and soak that toe in Epsom salt. Get a tub, water, Epsom salt and soak it. Why? It, it's a disinfectant. <laughs> None of that is any good as long as it sits in the box. I'm trying to tell you something. Folks, God doesn't want to just keep pouring salt into your life so that you can enjoy your food. God doesn't want to keep giving you light in your life so that your path is lit. God doesn't want to just keep giving you water so that you can have enough to drink for yourself. But he wants to pour water into your life so that you can bring the water of life everywhere you go. He wants to give you enough salt so that you can be shaking the preservative of God's salt everywhere that you go. And he wants to give you enough light so that you can be a city set on a hill that even those that are far off can see the light and come to Christ. Give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, the scripture says, because God will supply your need. Givers. So church, I'm challenging you today, not only for today, for what I'm about to present in just a moment, but as we look into 2021, I said it last week and I'll say it again and you'll probably hear me say it many times this year. God is looking for us to be givers of water, to make a way in the wilderness and a stream in the desert, Isaiah said in, in those verses from last week. Why? Because people are dying out there from false religion and agnosticism and hatred and bigotry and all manner of sin. And we have the way. We have the water. We have what they need. But they're not going to just come and find it because the enemy of the church, the enemy of our God, the enemy of our souls, has made them believe that the church has nothing you need. They're backwards. They're out of touch. They're out of time. They're dying. They're on their way out. There's nothing there. So we've got to be way makers, church. We've got to be stream bringers. We've got to give water. Give <laughs> I'm just a little excited about this because I believe that God is trying in this winter season spiritually to reshape us and prepare us for what he is going to call us to do. And I want to be a part of it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this challenging scripture this morning. Help us all to be givers. Lord, not looking for what we can consume upon ourselves, but being willing to give away that which we have so that others may be blessed. Because, God, we know if we give away our last morsel of food, if we, under your direction, give away the last dime in our checking account, if we give away the last ounce of our strength, God, when we're doing what you have told us to do, we know that you will resupply and that what you resupply will be abundantly greater than what we have given away. One little meal from the widow turns into months and months of food for her whole household. Oh, God, teach us to be givers. Those of us who are already giving, Lord, show us how we can even give in greater ways. Lord, because the need is great. The need is great. Lord, don't let us relegate this sermon to just being pastors asking us to give more money because there's so many other ways that the church, that the world needs Christians to be givers other than just writing a check. So speak to us about what you have already given us that we can start with, how we can begin giving in our little circle to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before you go, before we dismiss this morning, uh, last Sunday, the board met, and uh, in our meeting, a need was presented. Now, I wish that I could show you a video or show you some pictures and tug at your heartstrings by showing you some pictures, but I don't have any. But what I am going to give is I'm going to give you a chance, if you're able, 
to be a blessing to a church, a church that is struggling, often will ask you, give for Africa or give for Central America or give for the Philippines. And those are legitimate needs. But we've been made aware of through, uh, uh, through Charlotte and, and Richard's son, Tim, a church in uh, West Virginia. Uh, if you know much about Appalachia, you know how impoverished that part of the world is. And there's a church in, uh, I didn't bring the address up here with me, but there's a church, the name of the church is Four, Four Mile Church of Jesus Christ. Their pastor is uh, in his upper 80s. He uh, has been diagnosed with throat cancer, and unless the Lord heals him, it's terminal. And so he is trying to do his best to prepare and repair the building and the grounds so the church can bring on another pastor when he's not able to do it anymore, and the work of the kingdom there can continue to be uh, continue to go forward. One of the things that he wants to do is to put in a baptistry so that the church doesn't have to wait on summertime to go use the creek to baptize new believers, where they can baptize them in the church. We talked about this in the board meeting, and the board uh, and I agreed to underwrite this project for them. Uh, it's an estimated $2,500 project. A church, we have been blessed, and we've got money in our missions account, and so we're going to, I've got the check on my desk. We're going to send this church a love offering, a blessing to help them get this project done. Uh, I just feel like it's the right thing to do. I feel like it's a chance for us to give to a church in a needy position to help them reach, uh, reach the lost for Jesus Christ. As I was preparing for today, I told the board members that I would present the need to you and give you a chance to give towards that need. God, uh, God this week gave me this message on giving and was dealing with me about this. And I talked with, uh, with, with Richard who said that in his prayer time, God was dealing with him about the same thing. I would like, I would like for our church to see what we can do to help this church over the next year, not just a one-time offering, but let's see what we can do to help them. I'm not saying we're going to underwrite all their bills or we're going to take them on, you know, to pay for everything, but to see how much of a blessing we can be for this congregation. But Pastor, there's a lot that we need. Oh, absolutely, so let's give. Let's give and be a blessing to somebody else and see what God will do here and there as well. Maybe, maybe we'll be able to, to do some hands-on work down there to help them with some projects. I don't know. I'm going to make contact with the pastor, Lord willing, this week and, and, and put together a, a plan for how we can really start putting together a plan for how we can really help him and them. But this morning, I just want to ask you, number one, if you have financially that you can give into this church's mission fund, extra and above what you've already given, to give into the mission fund so that as we, as we determine other needs in the future, we can have something to bless them with. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor, I can't give anything right now, but I'll make a commitment. I'll give $5 a month, I'll give $10 a month, I'll give $100 a month until the end of the year. I'll give and we'll help out this four-mile Christian church uh, in, uh, do you remember the name of the town, uh, you or, say that again, Branchfield, West Virginia. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I tried to look it up uh, during worship time to see if I could find any information, and, and in the minute that I looked up real quick online, I didn't find anything, but uh, church, uh, it's just an opportunity to be a blessing. And I could say, oh, but we need so much around here. I need to buy this and I need to buy that. But I really feel that this has been brought across our, uh, our horizon so that we can 
be a blessing to someone else uh, and, and trust that God will continue to bless us here at Eastgate Assembly of God. Now, uh, I'm not trying to get too personal with anything, but uh, Richard was just sharing with us that for Tim to have come to him with this need, it means that there's something special that the Lord is doing through that pastor and in that church for Tim to be interested in how can I find a way to help this church in, in West Virginia. So uh, <laughs> so there's a stirring. Who knows that, that who knows the blessings that can come? So as your as your pastor, uh, you know, we're gonna make the pledge, uh, Rhonda and I are gonna make the pledge of giving two hundred and fifty dollars uh, right now. Uh, to towards this can't give it all today but we're going to make the pledge of giving $250 towards helping this church in West Virginia I don't have any pledge forms to give you what I'd like to ask you to do is just prayerfully see what the Holy Spirit is saying to you if you have extra t- uh, let's see are the offering plates Harold are the offering plates back there somewhere uh, I should have thought about this earlier Would you think about it? If you have extra that you can give in an offering right now and you want to give, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. But I would like for you to consider maybe making a long term. This is not your tithe. We're not asking you to redirect your tithe, but we're asking you to give, if you can, a little extra. Maybe I have it on my heart to see if we can take a a trip down there when I find out exactly where it's at and what they need, that maybe we can go down uh, and and do a, a work day or, or something down there to help them out. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if you feel on your heart like I'm going to give $100 right now, but I want to pledge to give an extra $10 a month, uh, let Richard know that he can write that down uh, to keep a record of the pledges. Uh, you're not going to be done for it. You will not be sent a bill for it. Uh, you know, it's it's just sometimes something doesn't really become real until we write it down, make a record of it. And so uh, if it's a one-time gift, you can give in the offering plate right now. If you'd like to make a continuing gift and say, I'm going to give as the Lord blesses me a faith promise of $5, $100, whatever, then see Richard after service. Thank you, church. I appreciate you letting me come to you. Uh, with a with a special need like that, and I just believe that God is going to, as we get more information over the next couple of weeks, I'll present you with some pictures and some slides and some further, deeper, detailed information about just exactly what's going on. Uh, so, uh, uh, amen. Yes. There's a creek that's running nearby that's eroding the uh, church grounds, and, and that, you know, there needs to be something done about that. And the, the, church, the church needs some help. And so, uh, uh, so we're going to see what we can do. And, and we will, I pledge to you that I will do my very best to make sure that we are being wise and prudent with, uh, with the investment that we make into this church. Uh, and so that's why I say, uh, we're going to check things out, and as the Lord provides, we'll have video or pictures or whatever to show you of what's going on. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity. You've blessed us so richly. Be a blessing to this church in West Virginia, God. We just pray for the pastor who has cancer. Lord, that if it's your will that you heal him from this disease, Lord, to touch him. Help him to be able to continue to pastor this church and to give him strength. He's done it for a long time, and he's well up in his 80s. So, God, you just bless him. Father, you bless him and his family and the work of his hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.